we, we wanted to talk today about marriage uh, because that video shows the power of God to restore marriage, but also because today, <coughs> May the 20th, 2018, is Marilyn's and my 40th wedding anniversary. So <laughs> here we go. Yeah. yeah. Can wow. you believe it? Where'd the years go? 38 of those at Forest Hill. Yeah, yeah. It seems like only yesterday that I saw you walking down the aisle and I went, wow, God, thank you so much. <laughs> And then also, we came here in 1980 and haven't yeah. left. We love this place, don't we? We do. Yeah. So we want to talk today about marriage. And please know this message is going to include singles because the text I'm going to read from includes singles, uh, words from Jesus himself. So it really is a message about relationships, but especially mm -hmm. marriage to give you encouragement, really, amidst what we have learned is a false narrative about 50% of all marriages in America breaking up, and the church is right there with that statistic. It's just not true. It's an urban legend. So if you're ready, let's jump into the text today from Luke and Matthew's gospel. The uh, teaching that we're in right now, the series is entitled Tough to Swallow. This is some difficult teaching from the lips of Jesus about divorce and remarriage, but you know, if we're faithful to this book, we need to teach this as well. So out of reverence for the reading of the scripture now, if you're able, would you please stand? From Luke 16, 18, Jesus said these words. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So you're going, what does that really mean? Well, let's look at Matthew 19, where Jesus expanded upon this teaching. This is the word of the Lord. And the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of Jesus' day, came up to him and te tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs, if I may use singles there. Uh, there are singles who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made uh, eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Okay, tough to swallow, a difficult teaching, and here's what's going on. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, uh, there was a teaching in the law on how a woman could divorce her husband, and it was a teaching that was very clear from Moses. Well, over the decades and centuries thereafter, a debate arose as is often the case between the conservatives and the liberals. Uh, the very conservative believe that you cannot get divorced for anything except sexual immorality. The liberals believe you could get divorced for if your wife burned the toast, anything and everything. So Jesus enters the scene as a renowned, thoughtful, intelligent rabbi. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, come to Jesus and basically ask him the question, who's right? the conservatives or the liberals? Is it right to divorce for any and everything, which is an easy, greasy culture, or should it be much more difficult? And you'll see that Jesus sided with the conservatives. He said it should not be commonplace, especially among those who believe. And then he gives four distinct teachings that Marilyn and I want to cover in this text, but then move on to especially the encouraging words we want to give you today. 
First of all, when asked the question, do you side with the conservatives or the liberals on this, the first place Jesus goes is original intent. He goes to Genesis 2.24 and Genesis 1.27 before the fall. He said that God made everybody male and female, two distinct genders. And then those male and females leave their families in Genesis 2.24 and they come to one another and they make a long-term permanent commitment to one another. They cleave into one another. And then Jesus gives the goal of marriage and that's that two distinct, very different people, male and female, come together and become one. It's almost like Eve was created from Adam's side, and then through marriage, she comes back and they become one. So again, the goal of marriage is for the two to become one, and and that was original intent from the beginning. It was. So then the next step after original intent, Jesus said, was giving a reason for why divorce occurred. For after teaching on original intent, and that was God's design, The Pharisees asked the question, well, then how come Moses granted a certificate of divorce? And Jesus said, well, it's because of the hardness or the selfishness of your heart. For what would happen in that day is a man would divorce his wife, marry another for convenience, a week later divorce her, remarry his old wife, abuse her some, then divorce her again if he found somebody else he wanted to marry for a period of time, and that would go on and on. So Moses' teaching was really to protect the wife. That once the divorce had been made, she was not to remarry her husband who was abusing her. And we've actually seen this and heard about it in cultures today, haven't we? Yeah, a friend of ours that was just visiting us from the Middle East said in his congregation, there was a woman whose husband not only had married her, but then he had three affairs, and in their culture they had to marry him. So he had married three wives out of convenience. And the sad thing is she was staying there, and she was having to serve those wives. And it's interesting that our friend who's the pastor of a church had brought her into his church and was helping to rebuild and restore her life that she didn't have to live under that and jesus makes it clear that the reason that kind of thing happens and husbands and wives today go through divorces Mm -hmm. plural especially is because of the hardness of your heart it's because of selfishness you know extensive studies have been done i'm really joking but the reason people get divorced is mostly because of selfishness of the hardness of their hearts they want what they want when they want it and they just get rid of the old to get in the new and jesus said that was never god's intent from the beginning he wanted a permanent relationship where two people Mm -hmm. become one so that's the reason divorce happens then jesus does give an exception The, uh, the word is pornea sexual immorality it means any sex outside the covenant bond of marriage any And I'm thinking if he lived today, he would include pornography in that. Interestingly, the word sexual immorality, pornea, is the word from which we get porn or pornography. That God intended that special union to be sealed with continually by the sexual relationship between a man and a woman. So when adultery or fornication or something like that breaks apart that bond... The person who is offended has the right to remarry. But what Jesus' tough teaching is, he said, if you are the one who offended the other, if you're the one guilty, if you remarry, you're forcing your new wife to commit adultery. And you're committing adultery. Plus, you are causing your wife, whom you've left, to marry somebody else and really commit adultery because that bond should not be broken. I mean, that's the teaching. And it's hard. Um, Now, we want to make sure that we stay clearly right now, that we understand that Some, maybe many of you, are in your second marriages. And I think Jesus would say to you, if that's where you are, work hard to make this one work. Work hard to make this original intent. Work hard for that permanent bond where two become one. I'm sure that's what he would say to you. Mm -hmm. But he's taking the conservative position. He's really saying that divorce should be rare between people, especially those who call themselves his followers. Now, you also need to know there's another exception in the Bible. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. Paul was ministering in a culture of unbelievers, and one would often come to faith in Jesus and the other not. And he's being asked the question, what happens when the unbelieving spouse leaves the believing spouse? Is the believing spouse able to commit a uh, divorce? And Jesus and Paul's answer is yes. And desertion for us, and we want to say this very clearly, Desertion for us is physical abuse. Again, Jesus didn't have that in his culture, but if he lived today, we are certain he would say, at least to those of you who are in an abusive physical relationship, 
to what? Get out and be safe. <laughs> Protect yourself. Yeah. We know he would say that. He wouldn't ask you to stay in a relationship where you're continually being beaten up. Now, we've seen marriages, though, yeah. where they've separated, and through the grace of Jesus, like what you saw yeah. in that video, individuals in that marriage were transformed, and they were able to get back together. But yeah. it takes a lot of work and a lot of counseling. Well, and I think both partners were turning to Christ and became new people. So I think it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of a community around them. And especially when you see people come to faith in Jesus like that video we just saw. Well, and that video was sent to me before they even put it on their website. And Josh Visser that created that video that we traveled to India with said, y'all aren't going to believe the rest of the story. So I'm really eager to call him and get, you know, the whole background on all that. He mm -hmm. said it's much more dramatic than you even see in the story. So the thing is, in India, and I don't really know why this is, but when God starts moving in a culture like that, I mean, we've seen miracle after miracle after miracle story, haven't we? You even talked to somebody over there who'd had uh, their wife raised from the dead. Well, we, they sent us the picture, yeah. yeah. So it's just, I don't know. We can't really ever say God loves one culture more than another. But I think when he's moving, and remember, they, they, a lot of them had never even heard the name of Jesus. And when he's moving to get the gospel message out, it just seems like there are amazing things you that happen. You see individual lives yeah. transformed by the power of the gospel. You see marriages transformed by the power of the gospel. You see communities transformed yeah. the least, by the power of the gospel. At the very least, it gives us hope that God really is that strong. And if he yeah. did it there, he, he can, can do, do it, it here, folks, yeah. for you as yeah. well. He yeah. really can. Would yeah. you praise God for that? Yeah. He can do it yeah. for you. He's no respecter of persons. Yeah. He doesn't care whether you're Indian or Chinese or Lebanese or American. He'll do yeah. it for you as well. Now, now the disciples responded mm. to this teaching where Jesus took yeah. the conservative position. Mm. Man, it might be better not to get married. And you know, Jesus didn't give them an out. Yeah. He said, it's tough. I mean, we've been married 40 years today. It's not been a perfect marriage. Yeah. We bumped each other on yeah. more than one occasion. Well, you always say the two people... When they get closer together, they bump more, they right? Bump. So we've gone through our And bumps. we've had to practice Ruth yeah. Bell Graham's famous quote. Two forgivers. <laughs> yeah. The best marriages are made up of two forgivers yeah. because you have to constantly say, I'm really sorry. Man, I blew yeah. that one. Please forgive me. And the other extend grace, yeah. which is what Jesus has done for us. But we like being married after 40 yeah, years. That's the good indeed. news. Yeah. Well, let's take a moment and do the last section after Jesus said, yeah, this is a tough teaching. Then he went into a teaching for singles, for singles as well. Yeah. And he said... There are some singles that are called to be such. And we Paul made that one, clear in 1 Corinthians we 7. We talked to a young man at the last service that said, you know, I think I'm being called right now because of X, Y, and Z in my life to give my full attention to this and to be single for at least for a while. Yeah, and there are others, though, that we've met, not many, but a few yeah. who really have devoted themselves to the cause of advancing the kingdom of Jesus. And they know that having children and a spouse would make that more complicated, more difficult. So they feel called to being single to spread the kingdom of God. And Jesus addresses them. Now, some of you want to be married. You're but single that, and you desire that. Talk about that's that. That's like please, my honey. dear friend in Africa. She was trained as an accountant, brilliant woman. And when I was over there the last time, she said, you know, I read all the teachings about singleness and everybody says I'm supposed to be content as a single. And she said, I am content. I have a deep faith in Christ. But she said, I go back and I read Genesis and it says it's not good for man to be alone. And she said, I think that means it's not good for a woman to be alone. So I'm just going to believe that God has a spouse for me. And she just clung to that. And year after year went by. But sure enough, she met a wonderful young, not young because they were older, a wonderful middle-aged man. And they even uh, had a baby mm -hmm. when I just met them. So it's just she was so thankful that God had brought that person to her, but she said, I never felt called to be single. So those out there who feel called to perhaps be single, what would you say to them? Who do feel who, who, called? Who are still waiting for, excuse me, the spouse. Uh, what would you say well, to them? Well, you know, I think it's like anything. When the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart, I would say, delight yourself in the Lord. And make that your, your end game. Or, or seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things are added unto you, right? Yeah. And it, it's not that different from when we went year after year after year for a total of 96 months without children. And you were about to have to peel me off the floor after a, a long amount of waiting. And one day, you know, you said to me, and it wasn't in a snarky way, so understand I, I can that. be snarky, by the way. <laughs> I just want to make sure you know well, that. Well, we both mm. can. But, but he <laughs> said to me, you know, because I just wrestled and I'd prayed and I'd you know, sought the Lord, and I, I was just kind of at the end of my rope, and um, he said, you know, I, I just don't think that you're ever, and you were saying it about ourselves, you, I don't think we're ever going to be happy with a baby, thank you, until we're happy without one, 
And those were turning point words for me. And I think that the same is true for marriage. You know, you're really probably never going to be happy as a married person if you're not happy and content as a single person. And I can guarantee you, you'll be a better spouse if you find that contentment first in the Lord. So mm -hmm. is that it how is you would exactly say what I would want you to say. And, and we want to now move into some very practical ways that you can make your marriage work. Uh, and, and one of them will be about developing yourself as a person that before you try to find the right person, you become the right person in Christ, that you allow your own personal life to be transformed radically by Jesus so that you're ready when that person comes mm -hmm. to you because we believe that when the pupil is ready, the teacher will come. So here are four different, uh, three different ways that you can continue to develop yourself in Christ, be ready for the relationship to come, or in your own marriage right now, increase it in its solidifying effect so that you can be one together and not even have divorce enter the picture. Now, we want to begin this section of these three teachings by saying this. We think America's been sold a bill of goods. How many of you have heard and even repeated that 50% of all American marriages fail? We've all heard it. Yeah. How many of you have said, and it's about the same in the church. Mm -hmm. now, now, Marilyn and I are raising our yeah, hands we because we've that. said it yeah. too. But we have done recent research with a lot of new information that has convinced us that that is urban legend. It's not true. And, and what we've done in America is we've convinced the total population that marriage just doesn't work. You've got a flip of the coin, one out of two, it's going to fail. And in the church, Jesus doesn't make any difference. And folks, it's just not true. A researcher by the name of Shanti Feldhahn has recently come up with a conclusion that is astounding. She has graduated from Harvard. Indy Marilyn, share about her background. Well, she was a Harvard grad student who went ahead and graduated from Harvard and then went to Wall Street where she was an analyst. And then I think she hopped over and spent some time working in Washington, D.C. And she was not looking for these findings, but she was doing some demographic studies. And she began to see statistics that were sort of surprising to her. Because like us, she had always heard that one out of two and in divorce. And so she began to find out that if you really break it down and do a thorough study and actually use good science, um, that, the, that the research does not show that marriage is in as bad a trouble as everybody thinks. Even though we all know marriages are, that are breaking up, don't get me wrong. But she said that the divorce isn't the greatest threat to marriage. She says it's more the discouragement or the, the bad press. She thinks that's the biggest threat to marriage. And, and here's what she discovered, that 71% of all American marriages are satisfied. 71%. And that didn't include the widows or widowers who had satisfied marriages. She estimates that as many as 75 to 80% of American marriages are are satisfied. Now, she'd be the first to say that that 20 it's to 25 percent is still too right. many. And, you know, I think we need to really dig into what she's saying a little deeper. Her book, The Good News About Marriage, is something we both want to read and find out more. But it was, it was so inspiring to us to realize that maybe things are, are better than we've yeah. heard. And then the bad news makes people, you young people especially, not want to get married. It makes you delay marriage because you think it's inevitable. You've got a flip of the coin, 50-50 chance of it working. And it's just not true. Most marriages are satisfying. Ours is satisfying. And we want to give you three insights that will allow your marriage to continue to be satisfying. And if you're a single person, to do these things, to be ready for this marriage possibility for you and allow you to see that God's will from original intent really can occur. The first one is develop your spiritual side. Develop your spiritual side. Become the person Jesus wants you to be, first of all. Again, for singles instead of waiting for the right person, become the right person. And we really believe that that spiritual side of your life together in marriage, where you pray together, you worship together. I mean, the divorce rates for those who just do those things, honey, is it's unbelievable. Low. Well, and you know, let's jump back to the 19, like late 70s and early 80s. And this is when we were coming along dating and getting married. Even the Gallup poll, and this is again, the Secular Research Institute, found, found out that, that couples that simply pray together, and I think they might have, I don't even know if they said pray daily, but couples that pray together had about a 1% chance of getting a divorce. And so you heard the lingo kind of spawning off of that, the couple that prays together stays together. But, but I think the point was clear that, that couples who actually practice their faith, not just slap that Christian label on their forehead or I'm an evangelical, that they actually 
pray together. And then a more recent study, would you like for me to share Please, about that? Well, this one actually is the one that grabbed me more because this was done at Harvard. And it was, it's interesting because it didn't come out of any kind of religious like background. It, the study was from the, um, the School of Public Health. So they were looking purely at the practice of, they called it religion, from the standpoint of, well, let's see what kind of things happen in the population when people are religious. And, and they, made, they did make the clarification that they actually practice their religion and they attend worship services together. So that's all they said. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't say that was praying every day. They didn't say that was reading your Bible every day. But if couples attended worship services together, they were more likely to live longer. They are less likely to be depressed they have a lower suicide rate, and then for the purposes of what we're talking about today, they had a much lower divorce rate. Mm -hmm. So I think that's encouraging. Yeah. And if you take that outward and continue to develop that spiritual side of your lives together, of where you not only just pray together, worship together, but study God's word together, we're going to talk about serving together in a moment, but develop all the spiritual yeah. side of your relationship. That's what Jesus meant in these verses when he said, what God has joined together no flesh and blood person can separate. See, God is spirit, folks, and when God enjoins a man and a wife in marriage, you are so inextricably connected to one another, there's no person who could ever enter your lives that would cause you to separate. Well, and I love the fact that the bar is not set up here that you have to have a PhD in theology or be a minister or whatever. He's just saying, you're just talking about garden variety. You go to church with your wife and you practice your faith like you would as a Christian yeah. and don't just slap the label on your head just practice what you what you say it is the surrender of your life to Jesus it's a childlike faith isn't well, it well like we saw with Monica it just gives their lives to the Lord and operates in the trust and surrender with him and day after day and month after month and, and year keep, after year and of course I'm yeah. gonna make this quick statement for you men out there I believe we're equal in our marriage in every way I mean who thinks I outmarried myself that I outran my coverage thank you very <laughs> no, much I really none. did um, but you, the it's a no-win question, right, guys, <laughs> so just forget it. <laughs> but the truth is God has called me to be the spiritual leader of my home. He has. Because I think men tend to let women do spiritual stuff, and we need to step to the plate. So I'm the one, when we're together, who initiates prayer. I'm the one who reads the scripture to my family. I'm the one who makes worship an important part of my family life. My kids, Marilyn, see me as the leader, and they will naturally want to follow dad husband who will lead his family in a godly way again it's not neurosurgery it's something we all can do in a simple way and when we do it i think god cements our marriages yeah. and our families together and, and that's not to say that we don't all have spiritual interaction and that yeah. i don't share scriptures with the kids too or bring them along in our faith journey but i think we like it that they see that you're leading and, and if so. the husband isn't then the wife's going to have to step to yeah. the plate right well one more school shooting this week mm -hmm. you tired of them i am and why won't people look at two things I think that's at least contributing to it? One is the breakdown of the family. And secondly, the mocking of God in our culture. Hmm. Will we not look at those things and see that they don't have a downstream effect upon how especially children behave and seek after a culture of death, not of life? So develop your spiritual side. Single, married, that will help cement marriages together. Singles, it will prepare you for marriage. Secondly, develop the relational mm -hmm. side. Talk about that. Yeah, and you know, again, this is all just basic human <laughs> love for one another. It doesn't mean you have to go get a master's in counseling. But we always say to people, you know, you're not going to develop a good relationship unless you spend time together. And, and people try to tweak it and figure out all these different relational dynamics that they can bring to bear in their marriages. And I kind of just want to say, just be together. I've had couples tell me, oh, we're having so many problems. We don't like each other and we're fighting. And then they'll come back from a vacation and they'll say, but we really like each other on vacation. And I'm kind of like, well, if you didn't like each other on vacation, then you can remember how to like each other. And mm -hmm. you did get married for a reason. So I think it's just something happens when you spend time together. So we just echo something we've said repeatedly to you through the years. Make sure you have a regular weekly time together, date night, day off, whatever it is. And you spend time together become each other's best friends it's not difficult here's what Marilyn and I do on that time together drinking a cup of coffee I ask her honey how's your heart how's your heart and she shares with me her struggles things I can pray for whatever that might be and then interestingly she looks at me and says David how's your heart 
and I share with her some of the things going on in my life, and then we pray together, and, and we become each other's best friend. If you'll develop this relational side and become each other's best friends, which is not commonplace in our culture because we're hearing repeatedly numbers of men and women to their friends bashing their spouse. Well, I mentioned that in the book because that's one of the reasons I wrote the book about how to honor your husband. It's because some of my really young friends were saying things to me like, yeah, we're going out to lunch with our girlfriends at work, and um, they're bashing their husbands so much, we don't even like to go out to lunch anymore. And I thought that was kind of a female thing until this weekend at a wedding, a husband said to me, you know what, I'm kind of tired of being around my guy friends because they're always bashing their wives. So I'm thinking, you know, that's really gotten down to a low level. That means the relationship already has started to deteriorate. And I kind of wonder if James Dobson isn't right. I, I recently heard an interview where he said, you know, I've been studying marriages for decades. And of course, he's kind of the guru of Christian marriage, right? He said, I've been studying marriages for decades. We know about the issues like alcohol. We know about the issues like other addictions. We know about pornography. We know about abuse and violence. He said, but you know, at the end of the day, I have, I have become convinced that the most dangerous thing facing marriages in America today, that's at the root of a lot of these other things, is just plain busyness. And he said, I think busyness is the scourge of American marriages. And, and when you're together, you talk and share your heart. And do this, guys. Gals do it as well. Just look your wife or husband in the mm -hmm. eye. Marilyn, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for 40 years of marriage. Mm -hmm. Thanks for putting up with me when I have been snarky and difficult. <laughs> and I'm sure I was very hard to well, live and with. And I've been right back at you. So. Thank you for loving me. Thank yeah. you for the times that I've been flat on my face and worried mm -hmm. if I could even get up and keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. The days when discouragement overcame me in ministry and other yeah. things. And you were the one who said words to me that kept me moving forward. And if I'm successful today as a man, it is mm. largely because of you. I just want to publicly thank mm. you well, thank for you. all you've meant to me these 40 well, thank years. You, thank you. Thank you. Well, I believe yeah. in you. So, I mean, well. do, do that. Do, just look your spouse and just say thank you for, and you know the things for which you can thank well, them Well, we've for. said gratitude is yeah. kind of right up there with all the magic that makes a marriage work is just being thankful. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, and it, you just kind of did this. I didn't know you were going to say that exactly. So thank you. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> believing the best about your spouse, you know, there's some really neat literature out there. And he, Gallup is so funny. I wonder, don't you ever wonder how they get an idea to study this? But Gallup <laughs> wanted to know what are the ingredients of the best marriages. And Marcus Buckingham was the actual researcher. And he found, you know, that when you look at the best marriages, one of the traits that a, one of the traits that arises to the very top is that the spouse believes better about the other spouse than they believe about themselves. In other words, you think better of me than I think of myself, and I think better of you mm. than you think of yourself. And the cool thing that happens there is that, I think, fosters just plain old gratitude, mm -hmm. don't you? I do. And before I forget it, Meryl and I have written two books, Eight Grades to Honor Your Wife, Honor Your Husband. I have a companion to this book. And we wish we could counsel with every marriage out there, every single. We wish we could. But we wrote books, and please, they're available in the foyer. If you can pay $10, great. All the money goes to missions work, like in Mission India. That's where it goes, not to us personally. We don't profit from them. But also, um, it's a chance for you to read our advice to you in a one-on-one -on -one way from a book. So that's why we wrote them. We hope they might help you. Well, and like I said, in my, my, in my case, I was somewhat prompted to write the book just by the growing levels of disrespect and dishonor. But as we both got into it, we realized that, you know, God wants marriages to work. He doesn't, again, set the bar up here. He sets it down here. And there's some really basic things people can do to make mm -hmm. marriages strong. Develop your spiritual side. Develop your relational side. And thirdly and finally, develop your service side. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Yeah, well, I always say that serving is self-help. And I don't think I made it up, but I sure do believe it. And all those years that we couldn't have children, it's so odd that the one thing, you know, I tried to pray myself out of the funk. I tried to memorize enough scriptures that I would finally get healed. And, you know, it just took forever. And I somehow mysteriously discovered that when I started giving my life away, particularly to the least and the lost, and I started down in the urban community and then I found my way over to Africa. But when I was serving the least and the lost, it was like serving with self-help to my own soul. So I have concluded, and we've watched this in our marriage, that when we serve, and especially if we're serving together, it makes our marriage stronger. It does indeed. If you're trying to become one, if that's the goal of marriage, which it is, to become one, two very different people become one, you develop the spiritual side, you develop the relational side where you're my best friend, as I've teased yeah. so often. 
It's easy to leave your spouse. It's impossible to leave your best mm-hmm. friend. But this ministry side is another super glue it's of like becoming super one. Glue. And the thing is that you might be looking at us and saying, oh, well, you know, you're the pastors of our church. And so you can hop on a plane and go to Nepal or India or wherever. And, and that is true to some degree, although there are families throughout our church that have gone on mission trips many, together many who have. tell me that this has strengthened in marriages. And maybe you can't go overseas, but some go down and serve in the like the homeless shelter or maybe their reading buddies at school or I love the creative idea of finding the, the, the child in your, your kid's classroom that's misbehaving the most and bring that child home with you and start to reach out to that family or we have families throughout our church that are doing foster care. There are all kinds of ways I've watched people in this church find a, a way to serve others mm-hmm. and it's funny but we watch the marriages grow they, stronger, they stronger almost like as a byproduct I don't even think they would say to us oh our marriage has gotten stronger but we notice it and we mm-hmm. see that bond we, one final thing before we stop and, and that is another study that we have referred to in the past but still exists today and we've given this challenge over time uh, give your marriage the five-year commitment now this is assuming that in the five years that you commit closing the door from the outside and saying we can't get out um, you're going to practice spiritual principles and do the very things we're talking about so if if one does it and the other doesn't do it it's not going to work but if both of you will work hard and close the back door for five years studies show that the satisfaction level in your marriages rises to the national norm but you know, and I know what you're saying about both people having to commit, but I'll never forget that I was out in the foyer a couple years ago and a lady came up to me and she said, you don't know me, but I heard David talk about that five-year rule. And she said, my husband was kind of wandering, but I just decided myself I was going to really trust the Lord and commit to five years. Well, she did, and she just kind of kept doing the right thing and, and, again, drawing close to the Lord. Well, he kind of caught the wave, mm-hmm. and then he started growing, and she said, you know, we are strong now after five years. We're so glad we didn't give up, and she said, and our children are so glad mm-hmm. that we didn't give up. Really so even solved. if you're the only one in the marriage to start with, and again, it's different for each of you. There's no magic pill. But we saw that in the video with Mission India. With the little child. The little child the one. and yeah. the mom wanted to give up. The yeah. dad was abusive and alcoholic, but they kept loving, and the power yeah. of the gospel eventually transformed his life and, and the there was a there was a team around them that kind of stepped in that brought some boundaries and I think I think it's just amazing here that really without the community of faith you're kind of a lone ranger get involved in the church folks Jesus loves his church